Okay. I hope. So for a little bit of review, we talked about uh, exponent rules. We have to memorize them, right? But our go-to exponent rules are things like a to the power of m times a to the power of n is a to the power of m plus n, which means that you can split up addition in the uh, exponent and rewrite it as multiplication of the same base. That's pretty useful. Uh, a to the m over n can be re rewritten as the nth root of a to the m or some version of that. You can let a m be one, right? And then you have a over, or a to the power of one over n, and then you just take the nth root of a, that kind of thing. Uh, what else, what else? A to the negative n is really just a to the, or one over a to the n, All right? Those are kind of go-to rules. There are others, but they're all intertwined from there. Uh, and then of course, a to the zero is one. That's a good one to remember. And we worked through examples using exponent rules and we used exponent rules to show why you can cancel things in the numerator and the denominator as long as you're being uh, multiplying or dividing, right? Because Division, let me grab my pointer here. Division is just a special case of multiplication. And so from here, we can do a lot of damage. Yeah. Uh, and then we talked about uh, given two points. Let me see here. Uh, where were we? Oh yeah, I'm not gonna redo it because it was a lot of work. Right, but we did talk about, okay, if I have an exponential function and we've seen questions like this, but it would say, assume that it's a linear equation, right? And it goes through these two points that gives you the general setup of the equation. But now we're told that it's an exponential function passing through these two points. And what we did was we said, okay, I have an input, I have its output. I have an input, I have its output. I'm gonna use those to figure out slowly but surely, figure out what A and B are in this general exponential function, right? Or B, you can rewrite B as one plus R if you want to. Right. So we also talked about, I'm not gonna do the example because it took a long time, uh, but we said given two points, we found uh, A and B in F of X is A times B to the power of X. In terms of review, we'll leave it there, but we're just gonna talk more about exponential functions. In fact, we're gonna recall because it's the, kind of the easiest way to think about continuous growth. So we said that if R is positive, then, and between zero and one, then uh, we have growth, right? Exponential growth. And so now we're gonna build up to what we call continuous growth. Okay? So everything's growing continuously, okay? Not like 1% uh, per year or something like that. Okay. And so recall the formula for compound interest, which was uh, kind of our, our first example or among our first examples of exponential functions. And so the amount after some number of years T in an account is going to be and I can't remember if we used a, I think so, but let me just confirm. Uh, okay, it looks like we did here. Oh, not pointer. Uh, yeah. Sometimes we use P for the principal. That's why when I teach business math, we use P, but 
Here we use a, it doesn't matter. Uh, a times one plus r over k. Oh my gosh. It doesn't show it, but it stopped the screen broadcasting. So, ah, driving me nuts. Share my screen. At least it's warm, warning me this time. Okay. Seems happy enough. Uh, one plus R over K to the power of K times T. Right, where time is in years. K, where I'll start with A is the principal amount. Right, A of zero. Anything to the power of zero is one, then you just get A, right? Where K is the number of compoundings per year, and remember the compoundings uh, is how often you're calculating the amount of interest that you've earned and compacting it or compounding it with the principal amount. And then you're earning interest on not just the principal amount, but also on the interest that you've already earned, right? So at those compoundings, your, the amount that you have that's earning interest is increasing, right? And so K is the number of compoundings per year and T is of course the time in years, has to be in years. So what we want to talk about today is what happens with continuous compounding, right? And so we can look at, uh, well, yearly compoundings, that's pretty boring, right? That's one time per year, okay? So if K is one, then you're compounding annually, right? Uh, Semi-annually, twice per year, then K is two. There's some go-to kind of Ks that we use. We can break it down to monthly, right? Then K would be 12, right? Uh, how about daily? K would be 365, right? So notice how K is, is increasing the more often you're compounding, okay? And so let's have a look at just an example. I had it all queued up, but... This one. Oh, I guess I should have the preliminaries. Come on. Paste. Okay. So here, if I have $1 invested at 100% interest for one year, this is just to illustrate uh, the behavior, 100% interest, that would be interesting, right? Um, but if it's compounding annually, then K would be one, quarterly, K would be four, K would be 12 for monthly, 365 daily, hourly, I don't know, something large, how many hours in a year, however many. Uh, number of, I guess, 365 times 24. I'm not going to do it, but I will write 365 times 24 hours per day. It's huge, right? And so you could even break it down to every minute, every second. And at that point, we can transition to thinking about continuous growth. Right. Or so from here, we can talk about continuous uh, growth or decay, I guess, continuous rates, rate of compounding. One thing, so it sounds awesome if you're compounding your money every second. That sounds really great, but at the end of the year, what's the difference? So you, 
if you're compounding annually and you invested $1 at 100% interest, then you get $2 at the end of that year, right? You've earned a dollar. Quarterly, you get quite a bit more, right? Relative to, to $2, 244, right? 261 if you're doing it monthly. So as you increase your compoundings, of course, because you're earning interest on the interest that's already been compounded, you're going to get more money as you increase your compoundings. But notice what happens once you hit daily, hourly, once per minute, once per second, things tend to level off, right? And so we, we, re we reach this uh, limit, right? So we approach kind of starting here, we approach a limit. And if you've taken any calculus, probably ugh, limits, who likes limits? Not me. Not me, right? But it is a limit. We're not going to talk about the limits, uh, but I'm just telling you that you approach this limit, okay? Now, as a fact, uh, should I just copy it down? I think there's a little box that I'll steal. Euler's number. You've probably already seen E. E is on our calculator, uh, and it's one of those constants that we use. And what it does is, so this is Euler's number. I only mentioned how to say his name so you don't sound like you don't know what you're talking about. Euler is how you say it. Um, so E is Euler's number. Uh -huh. Uh, e is the letter used to represent the value that 1 plus 1 over k, right? R was 100%, right? So 1 divided by the number of compoundings and then to the power of k times t, but we're going to let t be one year, right? Over one year. So then you just have k times 1, right? And so uh, this is this value as k goes to infinity, so as k, as k approaches, I'll do my infinity all nice like you guys do, there. Then you get e, so I'll rewrite it down here. So e, okay, fine. I'm gonna write it, e is the limit as k goes to infinity. And you don't have to think about that, but that's what we're saying of one plus one over k to the power of k. Yeah. So what does that mean? If we think back to our compound interest example here, oops, where is it? Here, right? If we have one plus r over k, what can we do? We can replace this with, e to the t or generically e to the x, right? Because t is still going to be there. This was a special case where we let t be 1. But now I'm going to replace this. So for continuous growth, for continuous growth, we have f of x is a times e to the power of x. <clears throat> which is almost easier than if you don't have continuous growth right i think it's nicer to work with and on a lot of calculators well you'll have e is on your calculator i think it's in a weird spot on this one or is that pi well they're in the same spot on mine they're down at the bottom, but I know you have a different calculator. Let's see here. I'll pull up my, wait, too many things going on that you can't see for some reason. It's 
So down here, right, you've got your, uh, let me zoom in. E. Yeah. So it's next to pi because they're both kind of go-to constants that we use. Wait. And how can I show it? So here, you'd have to go alpha to get there. And then copy. There. And then that's going to give you E. And then it's waiting for something to the power of, or let me see. Okay, you'd have to raise it to the power. It's not that clever, I guess. You do? Where is it? Oh, I see it. E to the something. That's a better option. <laughs> Although I guess it only saves you one keystroke, but still. All right, I'll put it here. You'd have to go shift first, but hopefully you're okay with that. Using a calculator. Uh, if you're using Desmos, yeah, I think it's EXP. Let's see here. Uh, let's see here. Oh, it's so clever. Just knows E is 2.71828. There's a song, but I don't know it. 2.71828182. Anyways. Okay, so you don't have to do EXP, but sometimes you do. Yeah. So it's our, our go-to base for a lot of things, right? Especially if we have continuous growth, uh, which we do a lot of the time. Now, how about an example? And hopefully, okay, we already did that one. How about this one? We did a version of that one, not that exact one. You deposit $1,000 in a savings account that earns 1% compounded continuously. Find the amount in the account after 10 years. So now I need, let's see here. Probably this. I forgot the R. I'm realizing now. I'll do it in red to punish myself. How else would I know what the rate is? Good thing we've got these boxes. So if we have continuous growth, then you're going to use this as your kind of base formula. So A times E to the power of R times X. And so if we have uh, $1,000, which is our initial amount, the rate is 0.01, so 1%. We want to find the amount in the account. So we want to find the amount in the account. Let's just write out A of T is A times E to the R times T. The variable is T, not X. That's the same thing, though. The initial amount. So if I want A of T after 10 years, I want $1,000, yep, times E to the power of 0 0.01 times 10, right? The rate 
as a decimal or a proportion times time, which is 10. All right, I'll use the calculator on here, why not? Um, 1,000 times, and let's see if I have, there's e to the power of x, that works, 0 0.01, and I wanna keep it upstairs, uh-oh, what's going on here, times, it keeps wanting to step down, but I don't want that. Okay, fine, I'm gonna wrap it up in brackets times 10, I get 1105.170918. I'm gonna, oh, it's doing that thing. It hides a lot in this room, or maybe I'm just doing it wrong. 1105.170918. Close that. Oh. There. Oh, that's gross. So the amount in the account after 10 years is going to be one thousand one hundred and five dollars and seventeen pennies which means you earned $105.17 in interest, which, <laughs> depends on what you wanted, I guess. Um, yeah, not great for 10 years, but if you did it for, uh, if we had done this previous example, which we skipped because we did it a long time ago. Uh, if it was compounding monthly, you'd have even less, only slightly less, but a little bit less. So you can try that one and compare the two, but we're moving on. I think there's a different example. A bacteria population grows at a continuous rate. So I want you to pay attention to that, right? Because if you're not given um, any information, then you have to, or if it's not explicit that it's continuous, right? Then it would just be a rate of 4% hourly, right? But now um, it's a continuous rate of 4% hourly, which means that your X or your T is going to be in hours, right? And so let's see here. We want to know generically, we've got F of X is A times E to the power of R times X. And let's figure out what we have here. So we've got a population of a thousand bacteria initially. And so we have a thousand bacteria to start and the continuous gives us the E as the base. No. And 4% per hour is going to be 0.04, but then how long we let it grow for is 24 hours, right? And so you'll want to convert that. Before you plug it in, but after that, you're off to the races. Let's see if I have an E to the X button. Whoa, I do. Who knew? Here I've been going alpha e to the power of something like a chunk. 
Uh, shift E. 0 0.04 times 24. The population size is going to be, I get 2611.696473. So you guys got. How much will it grow, right? It grew from 1,000 to 2611 or 2612, I guess. Uh, and so it grew by 1,612 bacteria in one day. My argument would be you can't have 0.69 of a bacteria. So I'm going to bump it up. Or maybe you can, I don't know enough about bacteria. <laughs> Grew by 1,612 bacteria. That's a question on a test because I have you know, a population growth question. Would be rounded down, would that be acceptable to? Uh, yeah, I'm okay with that. Uh, even if you stopped here, that's fine. I'm okay with that. I'm not looking for, cause that's a lot to keep track of. Uh, in one day. Nice. <clears throat> How about another example? I think it's this one. Uh, okay, maybe not yet. It's because I skipped a thing. Should have known better. Uh, Okay, we'll get there, we'll get there. So bacteria population grows at a continuous rate of 4% hourly. Find the actual, no, you know what? Is it okay? I want to just cut it because I. Yeah, we don't need to go this, huh? Yeah, <laughs> cut, it. cut it. Delete. It's going to take too long. It's not worth it. Okay. Um, there. I'm happy with that. We're going to move on. There's so many nitty gritty things that we could talk about. But uh, I want a new nitty gritty thing, the graphs of these. And we're just gonna kind of breeze through them, right? We spent a lot of time talking about transformations and things like that. Uh, but I wanna go to section 4.2, just briefly, we're not gonna spend a ton of time in here because we already looked at the general shapes of the graphs, right? We've got growth, exponential growth, or we've got exponential decay. And so in general, we already know what these things look like. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. But there are just a couple of things that I wanna point out. How can I copy this whole thing without the whole page? So in general, we're gonna have something like f of x is a times b to the power of x, where b is 
between zero and one is positive. Right. Then we get this growth, right? And then we said, okay, g of x, g of x is this a decay function, which also looks like a times b to the power of x, where b is, oh, there we go, between negative one and zero. If I let b be b zero, then it's just zero and that's not interesting. So I'm excluding zero from both, both of these b's. Okay. But if I have some negative value, right, then I've got decay, right? Uh, this should be one plus, this should be R, not B, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Just take a nap while I finish this there. And B is one plus R there. Crisis averted. Okay. Good. Um, there is this horizontal asymptote here, right? And if I shift this graph, then that horizontal asymptote is going to move around. Okay. Uh, but what's interesting about any shifts left or right uh, is that if I have f of x plus four, for example, right? So notice f of x plus four, which would be a shift to the left by four units, right? Is gonna be a times b to the power of x plus four. But by our exponent rules, I know I can rewrite this as b to the power of x times b to the power of four. Right, and so now this becomes a times b to the power of x times b to the power of four, right? I can split up that addition and make it multiplication of the same base, but then b to the power of four is just gonna be some number that would be absorbed by this a. It would just change to, to some new constant. And so here I would get a times b to the power of four times b to the x where b to the power of four would be my new uh, initial value. Yeah. So it doesn't change the, the form of the function, which is interesting. Okay. And here's a little blurb, a blurb. Oh, and I highlighted this, but that's just to remind myself to include this part of the blurb. So if we have some exponential function like this, a times b to the x, a is the vertical intercept of the graph. We already established that. That's our initial point when uh, x is zero, right? B determines the rate at which the graph grows. When A is positive, right? So if you have a, a positive initial value, you could have a negative initial value, right? Uh, the function increases if B is greater than one. That's why I screwed up earlier. Uh, and the function decreases if B is between zero and one. You'll have a horizontal asymptote at Y equals zero, right? We saw that it, it levels out and it never reaches zero. And this graph is gonna be concave up if A is positive and concave down if A is negative. 
So again, it just flips it on the uh, x-axis, right? That's the same behavior as before. And the domain of the function is all real numbers. And the range of the function, because we have a, a horizontal asymptote at zero and never goes below that, right? Unless we shift it down, is zero to infinity, not including the endpoint. How do I? Right, not including the endpoint, zero. One useful thing is, let me zoom in here. The graph is gonna pass through the point zero A. We already established that, we've seen that. Uh, but it's also gonna pass through one A, B. That's interesting, I think. And so A times B is your Y value when X is one. Let's see here. So here, there, two to the X has a base of two and an A of one, right? One times two to the power of X, right? So A is one, B is two. And so I already know that my uh, vertical intercept has to be at one. Uh oh, so many options, All right? And so here, let's talk about this one. A is one and B is two. And okay, that's okay. What if we know that the graph also has to pass through one times, or one AB? Well, AB is one times two, which is two. So when X is one, it has to pass through two. Oops, sorry, I went through, I went weird there. Two at three, no, here. Which gives me graph F. So here, uh, 0, 1, and 1, 2 is graph F. So you can use those two properties to, to match each of these graphs. And so here, 3 is our initial value, our base base is two, uh, which means that it should pass through zero three, right here. So it should pass through zero three and one six. Right. Well, there's only one luckily that passes through zero three, probably because they cut it off and we can't even see six, but it looks like it's on the, on the right path to pa crossing at one six. Right, and so that's what gives me C as my choice. Next one. Uh, try to cycle through my colors here. Uh, A is one, B is three. So I have to pass through zero one. In fact, just looking at all these graphs, they all have to have an A of one from this point on, right? I've, I've already used up the, the one easy one, the one easy get. How about one, three, right? One times three. Okay, let's see. So zero, one, one, three, which is what I tried to go for before, but that's gonna be D. How about E to the X, such a sneaky one, yeah. So you're just taking the, the little guys and putting them into like ABX? Yeah, no. exactly. And I'm using uh, this, yeah. this a lot. Yeah, 
So I identify A, I identify B, and then I can figure out what points. Right? And you can do the reverse too, but we'll focus on this. So in this case, A is one, B is E, which is roughly 2.7, 2, 2, 2, 2, 8, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I should really learn that song. Um, but I feel like it's one of those songs that never ends type of deals. Uh, so it should pass through zero, one, of course, and one A, B, which is one E, roughly 2.7. 1828. Starting here, okay, looks like it has to be E appropriately. Onto our fractional bases, right? One half to the X. A is still, I'll cycle through here. A is still one, but B is now one half which means that I'm gonna go through zero one, but at one, I'm gonna go through uh, one half. I don't wanna write over the Ds. There. So still going through here, but at one, I'm only allowed to go through at one half. Now it's really hard for me to see what one half is, you can kind of guess, but luckily we know what the last one is and it should be going through one and one third, which is hopefully less than one half. And that lets me kind of by process of elimination. And so I'm gonna call this a, well, here, and this should go through zero, one, and one, one third, oops, but I wrote one half, would have been very confusing, which makes it graph B. So knowing that it has to pass through, right? It has to pass through. Oh, I really did put it so zoomed in. Zero A and one A B is gonna be very useful just for figuring out the general look of this thing, right. which is all I really want. We're not gonna do a, a bunch of transformations or anything like that. Right. So here, use this fact to figure out what the graph might look like. You can use the reverse, right? If you have a graph, then if you can clearly see what it passes through on the y-axis, that's your A. And if you can clearly see what it passes through at x equals one, then that's A times B. But if you already have A, you can figure out what B is, right? So you could do it in the reverse as well. All right. Okay. Do this, do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. more graphs. Uh, you know what, I'm gonna include this note down here. Why not? So as we saw earlier, right, even if I shift on the x-axis left or right, right, x plus four, x minus four, whatever, uh, we can rewrite 
this exponential function as a times b to the x, right? The a just morphs and absorbs part of that b, right? And then the only other thing that we could do is we could uh, shift up and down, which is the plus c, right? Where c is going to be the horizontal asymptote, right? So you're just shifting your, your horizontal asymptote up or down, and then the behavior stays the same. But also, if you're shifting up or down, then the vertical intercept is going to shift to zero a plus c, right? So if you're shifting up, it's going to move up by c. And if you're shifting it down, it's going to move down by c, right? Because c would be negative. Okay. So I'll highlight that. I don't know why it's not part of this box. It feels like it's box worthy. Yeah. But uh, what about things like stretching and all that kind of fun stuff? It's all going to be absorbed by that uh, A. All right. We're not going to worry about that too much. But let's do an example. And while I'm in here, OK, good. We're going to write an equation for this graph. So what we can do is, well, we have our go-to move, which is to first identify what the y-intercept is. It's at negative 1. Right? When x is 1, Looks like we're at two. So here we're at one, two, and here we're at zero, negative one. But we also see that the horizontal asymptote, it looks like it's at y is equal to negative four, which tells me that we've moved down four. Okay. So if we want to write this equation, then I'm going to have, uh, let's see here, C is negative 4. And the y-intercept is at 0, uh, negative 1. But that negative 1 is a plus c, where c is negative 4. So a is 3, right? Yeah. Sold. Negative 1 plus 4. A must be 3. Or, right, if you just look at this thing, right? We are going through 0, negative 1, but this has been moved down 4. So if you just take everything and just kind of bump it up so the horizontal as uh, asymptote is at 0 again, then it's going to move up to 3, right? So you can convince yourself that way. So A is going to be 3, and We also see that it goes through one, two, which means that it's that a, b is two, but a is three. So three b is two, which means that b is two over three. Did I do that wrong? Why am I hesitating? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what did I do wrong? I don't know. Right, if B is two over three, here, I'll show you what I, why I'm hesitating. Uh, we said, what did we say? A was three, 
times two over three to the power of x. That's bad. Minus four. See how that's not the shape we want? Where did I go wrong? I am asking, where did I go wrong? I, I mucked it up somewhere. This would have also moved. Is that what happened? It also went down four, so it should be six. How come they didn't? One. A, B plus C or minus C. Let's try it. Uh, do, 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 do. And if you figure out where I went wrong, please jump in. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just winging it up here. Should this be six instead? Probably. I'll try it. Then B would be two. Change this to two. Okay, that looks good. And just to confirm, I'm gonna put in at x equals one to see where it crosses. Aha. Oh, it's on there twice, there. Try to screenshot that. Feel like we did it. Come on. That looks good, finally, but there was no note. How was I expected to get there? <laughs> this has to be six, because it's not from two, it's been moved down four, so then you have to move it up four. Not question mark anymore. How can we generalize this? One A B minus C. Right? Moves it up. Yeah. And huh? No, it's true, but it was only one component. And so here we were using the zero, so at x equals zero as a guide for drawing our graph, but we were also using one and whatever the value at one was for drawing our graph. And it just didn't highlight that from a, b, you're gonna move down C units if you've shifted it up and up C units if you've shifted it down. 
because that's where it was originally. We did it. Slight fumble, but that's okay. That's math. But it's important to notice when things don't make sense, right? When you see things like two over three, but you know that it has to be growth, right? Then you know that something went wrong. Okay. I think we're ready for 4.3, which is probably called something logarithms. You guys have seen logs before. I know it because Allison showed me your log log graphs. Log log logs. When do we use logs? Well, we use them for scaling because they're very useful for that. But also one of the things that where we kind of get logs from is if we want to solve something like two to the power of X is equal to 12, right? I've got X in the exponent, right? And so that's why logs are, the inverse of exponential functions, right? Because of their how we undo exponential functions. But if we want to solve something in the exponent, we're going to need logs. And so here, to solve for something in the exponent, We need logarithms or logs. Which means that we're going to need log laws. So that's a good place to start. Now, before we introduce the log laws, the number one log law uh, that we have is so we're going to have log laws to memorize but the number one log law is that if you take the log of a to the power of x you can rewrite that and this is a, just a rule as x times the log of a so notice how this X came down, down front, okay? And that's uh, the value of logs, is that you can bring it down and now you can multiply, divide by X and you can solve for X, right? But not until you take the log of this thing, okay? And so for us, going back to two to the X is equal to 12, well, thinking about two to the X is equal to 12, what you would have to do is you would have to take the log of both sides, right? Whatever you do to one side, you have to do to both sides. And so you would have the log of two to the X is the log of 12. Now you have log buttons on your calculator and that's just a number, right? But the log law lets you bring this X downstairs. So now you have X times the log of two is the log of 12. Log of two is just a number. Log of 12 is just a number. So now you can solve for X and you can say that X is the log of 12 divided by the log of two which on your calculator, and let me go back to the picture of your calculator, the fancy version here. Uh, oh, it only has, oh no, here, here's a fancy button. So we're here on your calculator. Uh, 
Ah, just grabbed it. Nope. We're going to be working with, or we're going to introduce logs of different bases. And so just like we had A, B to the X, right? We're, we can have different bases. And so here, this is log base 10. Okay. So here, this is log base 10 is how we write it. Okay. And it's called the common log. Oops. LN is log base E. Oh, we just talked about E. I know. And we need some way to undo it, right? And so log base E is called the natural log. And in a lot of sciences, the natural log is the, the only log. So I know in, well, at least when I was in high school, we called this lawn, but I don't do that anymore. I just call it log because it's the only log for me the natural log, but I know that's confusing, right? So uh, just be aware. If I'm gonna talk about the common log, log base 10, which I, base 10 is more for things like sound, I think, or I know, uh, and kind of wavelengths and stuff like that, which is not something I deal with in uh, statistics, which is my background. We use the natural log, and I'm going to go out on a limb and say that you guys use the natural log as well. Things like exponential growth, you have to undo it. So then you use the natural log. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it depends on the scenario. And we're going to see it doesn't matter. You can undo. It just uh, cuts out a little bit of work depending on what choice of log you use. And so, uh, so it doesn't really matter. But uh, then you have this fancy button where you can tell it log base anything of something. So here you can, any base. Uh -huh. Now, how about some log laws? Ba, 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 ba. Copy this in because I didn't remember the actual name. But it was just logarithmic functions, so no harm, no foul. Okay. Start with this box here. So the logarithm base B, so any base, and you have that uh, any base button on your calculator, which is what makes the calculator uh, fancy. Uh, written log base B of X is the inverse of the exponential function base B, which is B to the X. Okay, so if you want to undo B to the X, you use the log base B. How about how about this? Which means that if I take the inverse of the original function, I should get back just the input x, right? And so that's the the inverse property. What am I doing here? Function composition, right? I'm taking if the log base B of X is the inverse, right? I'm saying that 
f inverse of x is the log base b of x, then f of x must be e to the x. So then here, what am I saying? I'm saying that f inverse of f of x is equal to x, right? That's a function composition. And as a rule, the inverse of a function composed with the function should just give you the output or the, sorry, the input. Ah. Same thing here. What are we doing? B is f of x composed with f inverse of x. So now the input is log base b of x. So b to the power of log base b of x is x, which is the same thing as saying f of f inverse of x is x. Right. Thinking back to function compositions. Good. I always enjoyed exponents and logs uh, because there are rules. And as long as you know the rules, then you can do anything. Uh, but this part, for some reason, I just couldn't wrap my head around it. Um, I don't know why. I, I can't explain it now. But uh, so b to the power of a is equal to c is equivalent to log base b of c is equal to a. Okay, now the only way that I could kind of wrap my head around this is if I focus on this little guy here, wait, oh my gosh. Log base B of C is equal to A. If I take it like this, so the first thing I do is B to the power of A is equal to C, then that was kind of how I had to remember the relationship, right? B to the power of A is equal to C. It's harder going the other way around, but at least it's, it's something to remember that relationship, okay? And these are equivalent, even though they don't look like it. Okay. So you can rewrite exponential functions as logs and logs as exponential functions, depending on what you need to solve for, okay? And do I have, okay, an example, I think I do. So using that knowledge, We want to rewrite these in log form. So I have a base of two in the first one, an exponent of three. So a is three and is equal to eight. So c is eight, right? So especially if you have this relationship in front of you, it's not terrible, but this is equivalent to log base b, which is 2, right, of c, which is 8, is equal to 3. Now, if you do 2 to the power of 3, it should equal 8 on your calculator. But how about we use your calculator to do log base 2 of 8 and make sure that it's 3. So we've got that fancy log base anything. So I would use that because it's not base 10 and it's not, not base E. And so if you've got a fancy log base two of eight, you should get three. Confirm this on your calculator. Uh, let me see here. 
it should just be just press the button and then it'll have a little placeholder down in the bottom so that's where you put two and then you step it out into the next bracket or the next section and then do eight it's not is it not working hmm I get three. Hmm. Can I see? Oh, nice. Yours isn't giving you the fancy. Let's see. Oh, shit. Yeah, weird. But you're on this calculator. Yeah, so this two, like that spot isn't showing up. Oh, really? Yeah, that's weird. What if you try the regular log button? Does it give you a base? Is it? Right top column. Yeah. Yeah. Is this right? It was a bigger ask than I wanted it to be, I guess. We'll need to figure out how to get that working. They do the same thing. Might be a, a Google away. It's probably in the settings. Yeah. <laughs> But that shouldn't affect your logs, but hmm. how about the next one? Log base five of Q is equal to P. Why would that be useful just as foreshadowing? You're gonna use log base five to kind of dissolve a base of five, right? Because log base five of Q is equal to P. Right? And so um, we'll, we'll use that on Friday, I guess. But I think we'll, end here because your calculator is acting up and we need to sort that out. So uh, yeah, any questions, comments, concerns? Good luck on your physics, have fun and I'll stop this.